What happened at Pentecost? What didn't happen at Pentecost? That's what we're going to talk about today in Acts 2. So the first day of Pentecost arrives, and they were all together in one place because Jesus told them, go back to Jerusalem and stay there. And they were being very good. Then it says that it sounded like there was a mighty wind rushing, right? Didn't say it, there was a wind. You always know, see in the TV shows and the movies, this giant wind blows through. It just said it sounded like it. I can hear that. You know, sometimes when a storm is coming through and I'm like, uh-oh, here comes the wind, you can tell that noise. And so that's them describing it in a way that makes sense for them. Pentecost, it turns out, is a Jewish holiday, which I never connected the two when I was Jewish or even well, maybe up till today. But it is the Feast of Harvest. It was instituted in Exodus 23, 16. People tried to be in Jerusalem for this. And Pentecost means 50th. Remember when we talked about Jesus being the 50th generation? Again, 50. There's that number again. But the idea is, is that they are supposed to be there. And originally, not just because 50 is a number, but because they had a feast that took place over 50 days after Passover in Leviticus. The idea is that Jews would go to Jerusalem and observe it at the synagogue. And offerings, free will off and offerings were brought. And the reason I didn't recognize it is because we called it Shavuot in synagogue school. <laughs> so that was the name I remember it to be. In rabbinic tradition, they say it, it's the day that the Ten Commandments were given to Moses. And Shavuot, instead of Pentecost meaning 50, Shavuot means weeks. So we're counting the weeks that we had this feast. It's sort of an expression, like we were waiting for the Torah to come to us. And so on Passover, the Israelis were freed from enslavement. We knew that. And then on Shavuot, they were given the Torah and became a nation and a people and were given commandments. It, the big deal behind this is it's a time when not only, you know, we, we got the Ten Commandments, they were identified as a people, but it's the idea that this new covenant this new agreement is in place between God and humanity. So that's what a covenant means. Someday in Small Steps with God, I'll do a whole podcast about all the covenants. And it is tied back to agriculture. The idea that this is going to be a feast of the grain harvest. You know, wheat, we talked about the wheat and the chaff, the wheat and the weeds. This is going to be the wheat grain harvest. And we're glad for it because the barley is harvested at Passover time. And at, when that ends, then it is wheat and it's Shavuot. And then on the eighth day of Sukkoth, which is where you build that temporary shelters, which I called camping when I was a kid, <laughs> to, to celebrate the fruit harvest and to talk about the wanderings of the temple and God's altar through the desert while they were walking towards their promised land. So it means something to the Jewish people. I always thought that Pentecost was something that was created by Christians to celebrate this event that happened. But it makes sense, right? We are celebrating the harvest. Jesus kept saying, the harvest is near. We need workers in the field to bring in the harvest. Now, Jesus was with everyone for 40 days. And now we are going to celebrate this festival of this harvest. Neat. And so it says that people were there from all sorts of different languages. And it points out that there were a lot of people from all sorts of different places, different countries that came to Jerusalem throughout the Roman Empire and beyond to celebrate Pentecost or Sukkoth in Jerusalem. And it says that when this sound of wind came, it says that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to talk in other tongues. And it says, as the Spirit gave him utterance, the Spirit was telling them. It said the people there were, quote, bewildered because each of them were hearing it in their own language, hearing what was said. And it astonished everyone who was there. Aren't these the Galileans? Again, we're going to make hick comments again. Aren't these the backwater guys who probably are just a bunch of fishermen with barely any education? You know, they had education, but people look down on people who come from kind of hicky lands, right? And so they're like, how did these people know all these amazing languages? That just stunned everybody. 
And it mentioned some of the car- countries that were there, Parthia and Mede and Mesopotamia and G- Judea and Asia and Pontius and Phrygia, all sorts of places. They ha- all heard their own tongues telling the works of God. What I thought was interesting is I was thinking, I don't know, it had me thinking about the Tower of Babel and maybe and we'll have to do this kind of research at some point. But when God scattered everybody's language, it had me thinking that languages, it was seen somewhat as a curse, I guess. But instead, is it possible that when these languages got scattered, it was actually protective? I noticed that when people are in danger, they can talk in their own language. And usually, maybe the Romans wouldn't know that language. It was a sense of protection from their captors. And so while these people were being enslaved and telling to build the Tower of Babel, if people could speak in their own language and go, hey, you know, we're going to leave at midnight or you know, something like that, or I have extra bread in my cabin and you want to come over so I can get you some food. When you have extra language, it offers protection to people. But in this case, that protection isn't needed because everyone is there to hear the word of God. And so God broke this power of Babel thing so that everybody could understand perfectly well. Again, that was just kind of my first take about it, that this was almost a reversal. God is entirely safe to talk to everyone in their own language. And so now Peter's standing with the 11 and lifts up his voice and addresses them, tells them that you said that we were drunk because some people thought, well, all this language mishmash, clearly these people are drunk because they're a bunch of hicks. It's nine in the morning, right? We're not drunk. And so the first hour is 6 a.m. So the third hour is going to be 9 a.m. We're not drunk. Don't be silly. He's talking about the prophecy in Joel. In the last day, God will declare you'll pour out his spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your, Your young men will see visions. Your old men will see dreams. And every male servant and female servant, I will pour my spirit and they shall prophesy. I will show them wonders of heaven above and the signs on the earth below. You know, and this is partially in two parts, I think, is one, when the Holy Spirit comes and pours out onto everybody. We are all who believe in Jesus going to get the Holy Spirit. But then it talks about the end day. Then this is the part that gave me nightmares where there will be blood and fire and vapor and smoke and the sun will turn to dark and the moon will turn to blood. And then the day of the Lord will come, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You don't have to do anything. You have to call on the name of the Lord. And what I thought was interesting, I watched this movie that was based on a book by Hal Lindsey called The Late Great Planet Earth. And it came out somewhere in the late 70s and came on cable then a little bit later. And I don't think I slept for a week after seeing this. And when I talked to my grandmother about it, she's like, well, we don't believe in that. That's a, that's a Christian thing. They believe in the end of the world and this whole, you know, horrible end. And in reading this, I'm like, it was, it was from Joel. We believe in Joel. You no, know, my grandmother, in theory, believed in Joel. So why are you saying that? This is something that everybody would have understood because everyone, except for the Sadducees who didn't like the prophets, would have been believing in what Joel had said. And so it talks about this great magnificent day. And then he's saying, you know, people of Israel, you know, he's talking to everyone. Hear these words, Jesus, a man attested to you, attested is like I attest at a court case. I'm going to say, solemnly say that this thing happened that God had acted through Jesus and any God-fearing Israelite would want to know these signs and miracles because it is God certifying that Jesus did exactly what God told him to do. But then he says that this Jesus had to be delivered up for knowledge with God. You, You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. You know, you were responsible for this. And God raised him up because death would not hold him. It was impossible for him to stay dead. He is the author of life. There's no way he would stay dead. And it's interesting because people have used this passage poorly to say, well, this is the blood of Jesus on Jewish hands, but the blood of Jesus is on our hands. 
if you are a sinner, which is everybody, the blood of Jesus is on your hands. But he's actually talking to people who are very specifically there, who probably were the same people who were saying when he came in through the gate, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest, were some of the very same people who were yelling, crucify him, were some of the very same people who were watching him being crucified and then took off when he was taken down off the cross. A lot of people were all those things. And he's saying, look, you did this, but this was foreknowledge of God. This was something that had to happen. And death could not contain Jesus because of who he is. And so then he starts quoting David, that's saying that he saw the Lord at my right hand so I wouldn't be shaken and my heart was glad. You will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One, Jesus, seek corruption. So he didn't rot. He didn't decay in the grave, but instead was resurrection. And David was glad for this. Now, this is kind of interesting, I think, in general, because what? 40 days ago, 40, yeah, 40 days ago, Peter was cringing before this little girl who was like, hey, aren't you one of those people who followed Jesus? He was afraid of a little girl. And now he is getting up. We've never heard Peter quote scripture before. He, we, we heard him be boastful. We heard him be bold. We heard him say impetuous things. He is now quoting David and Joel and he is acting like a leader and standing up and telling people what for and what just happened, he has, in 40 days, transformed into a whole new human being. What he's doing, too, is he's saying, our patriarch David is dead and buried. His tomb is with us to this day. He is in his tomb. He did not raise. But the prophet, knowing that God had sworn an oath that one of his descendants would be on the throne forever, spoke of this resurrection of Christ and that he was not going to be abandoned to Hades. But David saw all this, was talking not about himself because David died, was in the grave, still in the grave, but instead it's Jesus. Was not abandoned to Hades, did not see his flesh corrupted and God raised him up. We saw it all. We're all witnesses. And so therefore, now he's exalted and sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and he promised us the Holy Spirit. Pour it out that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. David did not descend into heaven, so he's not saying this about himself, but he said, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstools. David clearly not talking about himself because none of those things happened. So he says, Israel, you have to know that God made both Lord and and Christ, Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. He's telling them, this is the real deal. You've prayed and worshiped God and looked for the kingdom of David and looked at the patriarchs and all the promises the prophets brought to us. And you know what? You are getting it now. You have seen the miracle of Pentecost. You've seen the sign of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said he was going to pour out the Spirit on all his people. And this is the first time, and keep in mind that he is saying the Father, Jesus the Messiah, and the Holy Spirit right here. So if someone says, well, the Trinity's not really in the Bible, Peter just said it right here. And it says that when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. You know, this, this broke their hearts, I think, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, so, you know, disciples, many people, apostles, just the 12 or 11 and now 12 again. What what do we do? And Peter says to them, the very first thing that John the Baptist said, that Jesus said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for your forgiveness of sins and you will receive the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. So it's not even something you're earning. You are going to get this as a gift because the promise is for you, your children, for anyone who's far off, everyone who calls the Lord, our God, Jewish, non-Jewish, everybody, everybody who calls on him received this gift. He gave many other words. He bore witness and continued to exhort them. And he says, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Whoever receives his words were baptized. And it said that 
those who received his word, meaning you can hear a word. That doesn't mean you're going to receive the word. You're open to the word. And it says 3,000 souls were baptized. I think it said that there were 120 people in that room, which now makes me think that that upper room was maybe not the place I saw. You know, obviously, when you go to Jerusalem, they say, oh, this is the upper room. We don't know for sure because that room would not hold 120 people at all. I don't think even squooshed in. So now I'm kind of thinking this must be a different room. They, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and the fellowship, breaking bread, which again is a callback, I think, to not only Jesus feeding the 5,000, but really the communion, the breaking of bread with each other. We are communicants. We are sitting together, brothers and sisters in Christ. And it says, awe came on every soul. And many signs and wonders were being done through the apostles. Through, not by. It's still God's work. They were just being the conduit. And it says that all those who believed were together and had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and belongings and distributed to anyone who had need. And day by day, the, they attended the temple, breaking bread together in their homes, receiving food. And they were, it says, with a glad and generous heart. They were sharing food. They were giving food. They were partaking in food, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their numbers day by day for those who were saved. This is kind of amazing because they waited and waited and waited. You know, I think that people thought that when Jesus went back, which was would have been day 40 after his death, this would have happened. The Pentecost would have been, I think, the 50th day. So they had to wait a little bit, but they did so. They were obedient. And Peter, I don't know, grew up. You know, he, he became that leader. He obviously clearly is leading the church at this point, and it pays off. That many thousands of people that very first night and the Holy Spirit pouring out on all of them. And this gets into a lot of complication when I read about theology, where the Holy Spirit comes into us and abides in us. So we, the Holy Spirit is living in us and helps us with words to say, helps us with praise to God, helps us know what to say to other people, helps us recollect the things we have heard of God and to be witnesses to those things. But you also see that that language is there too, where it says the Holy Spirit came upon, came upon Peter, came upon the apostles. And that is, this moment where you kind of need an extra boost. You need the Holy Spirit to fill you up because you're about to do something great. And that is really what is happening here. This very interesting transformation. I guess, you know, in a sense, it wasn't even this transformation from the day Jesus died and was resurrected to now. Even at that point, Remember, Peter went fishing, and then Jesus came back to them and was talking to him. And just however many days ago, he was saying, Peter, I love you with the agape love, and Peter couldn't say it back. And however many days later, this is 10 days later, suddenly Peter is in charge and quoting scripture and quoting the Old Testament, doing things and saying things we have never seen this man do. I mean, really quite stunning. And what I'm going to meditate on is that, that when God charges you, fills you with the Holy Spirit, puts you into this pattern, he gives you the tools and the strength and the boldness and everything that you need to do the job. He, he equipped Peter for this. And what I'm going to pray about is that God always emboldens me like that, equips me like that. You know, I do this podcast and I think, Oh my gosh, am I qualified to do this? I'm, you know, looking at resources and I pray that the Holy Spirit helps. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Loves talking about Jesus and loves talking about God and loves helping you know what to say and what to do. Yeah. Saying I'm inerrant or anything like that. But I believe that God is helping do these things in my life too. And I'm going to pray for more of that. And what I'm going to share with others is this fact that God can turn impetuous and denying apostle in X many days into this 
first leader of the church, bold, scripture knowing. God does that work and he'll do that work in other people too. All right. Well, Peter certainly gives us a sermon for the ages right here. And it's really amazing. Thank you everyone for listening to the podcast. Please remember, tell a friend. I hope that you can share this with someone else that they may enjoy listening to this podcast as we work out together the Bible, what it means, and can a lay person understand what is going on in the scriptures? That's what we're, we're finding out now. I hope you're reading along with me. And if you have anything to say, you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Thank you so much. Thank you.